Thank you for, for coming and for adjusting this. Um, my story, uh, am I echoing too much? Uh, so my story starts with, um, my work is basically photography and based on human rights that um, document the poverty in the United States and human rights across the world. Um, but it had to do a lot with um, my childhood. You, you see that um, I was born in the southern part of Iraq in Nasiriyah which is um, about 60 kilometers from the marshes. So we always had the rebels, um, a rebel mentality to fight against Saddam. It doesn't matter what government came in, we were never, we just want to be left alone. So uh, we'll start um, how we left Iraq and um, all six of us, yeah, I was raised by my mother and um, that's my whole life been, you know, my mother and been my idol and everything else. And that's the only person that never gave up on me. Um, throughout my life, um, I was a hell child, you know, and she was the only person in my life that, you know, my father is a said, forget you, you know, but she will always stay in my life, till today. And um, so 1991, Iraq invaded Kuwait, everybody knows that part, but then um, the United States told us in the South to uprise to overthrow Saddam. Well, you can't really overthrow a dictator with just AK-47, it's a joke, you know, it just, but you know, we thought we, we had a chance and some people thought they had God on their, on their side and they'll overthrow him. So I remember clearly I was sitting outside and when you enter, I come from um, Sugishyuk, which is, um, it means the Valley of the King or the Town of the Kings where all the tribe leaders live. And my house was one of the houses, you know, on the outskirts of the town, doesn't mean we were rich, it was, Basically, they push out the port to the outer skirts of you know, the, town, the city. And I was standing there banging on some metal, but I stopped banging on it, and something kept continuing banging. And I was like, huh? You know, what's going on? Then I found out it was artillery shells hitting us. The Saddam, he got, you know, he was very angry what happened in Kuwait, so he sent the Republican Guard to the southern part of Iraq to clean us up. All the um, uprisings collapsed in Najaf, Karbala, um, Sumawa, but Nasriya always been, you know, the city of rebels. And it's like, you know, even the name is the city, you know, the city of victory. So it's, um, but I'm not here to talk about the, you know, the past. I'm just, so I was sitting banging on this thing and artillery shells come, you know, hanging and hidden everywhere and um, we don't have a drainage system like the United States, you know, when it rains so much that the water, you know, goes. So when the blood, when people were killed and murdered and blood was all over, it really it just, it just sits there, you know, you either step on it, run over it. And um, so my mother um, was very young, you know, she was 23 years old, you know, for a mother to have six kids, you know, and, um, but she was like, we gotta leave, we gotta leave, you know, and we're like, no, let's just stay a few nights, you know. My father was the, the, uh, the opposite of the hero, you know. He, he gave me, I literally, you know, the day before, he gave me an AK and he said, you're a man, you know, and he was gone. So we didn't know what my dad is. And I thought that was the coolest thing in the world, you know, I, because you watch a lot of cartoons, which I still do too. But I mean, you know, and I thought this is the coolest thing in the world. Then I felt a tingling sensation. My brother slapped me in the back, saying, "My mom gonna, you know, kick your ass if she knows you have a gun." So we don't have guns in the house. So the next morning, I wake up, and my dad brother was a, he was more of a, a warlord, you know, in the south. And we wake up, and our front room was filled with like RPGs and grenades and everything a kid can imagine, thinking this is the coolest thing in the world. But you know, at seven and a half years old, you, you don't know what that stuff does. You, you see it on TV and you see you know, people throw it in. <coughs> then, you know, then the military invasion, and, um, that's what I got. I had too many second chances in life. And uh, the military invaded, and your own neighbors, your own neighbors, the people you grew up with were telling the Republican Guard he was, he was against you, he was against you, he was against you, and you know, and you see buses filled with, um, with people, you know, um, blindfolded. My age would be now, and a lot of the audience here, just going to the execution field while chemical alley infamous images were seen. And um, I decided, you know what, that guy told on us, I'm gonna shoot him. You know, I'm gonna shoot him. So I told my brother, 
the same you know brother that told me don't do it and I, and I somehow I convinced him he always been a pacifist but I never been a pacifist I always been like you know what's wrong is wrong and I told him no we're gonna shoot the guy and we're gonna save mom and we run away now at that age you really don't know what that means you know it all seems uh, like it's like a movie plot. you have it all in your head so my sister was just born she was three days old and um so I opened, we had like double front doors, they opened out and I pointed the gun at the person and I shot, right? Now, anybody who ever used an AK knows it doesn't shoot, it just, you know, it just burst. Then I remember it, it shot so many bullets that it flipped me upside down, you know, and I landed. Then then I decided to run with your little feet trying to run, you know, and my brother was gone by then. I was on my own, you know? and. Um, then I looked down at my sister, you know, we don't have cribs. It was like, you know, had like a, we, our culture is much different. So, you know, the crib was all the way to the ground, but it wasn't like a typical, you know, Western crib. And I see a little smoking hole right to my sister's head, you know? And at that time, you know, it's that age, you comprehend what it all means. At that time, you, you become an adult. You, you understand everything when I was staring at it. And my mother was so furious, I mean, she whooped my butt, you know, because first she told me don't ever use weapons, and second, you know, she said, um, don't ever hurt nobody, you know, but I, I grew up around my uncle saying different, but you know, my mother was always there with us, so I never picked up a gun in my life again after I got that, you know, butt whooping, I mean, it was like, I still remember it, you know, for today. <laughs> And she had a valid point to prove, you know, that guns are not a joke, and I could have killed my sister, and you know, so she decided that night that we're gonna leave. We're not staying here. My father already left, and we had to walk three days, you know, three days across, you know, to get to the to the United Nations and the U.S. military, and you know, to get to that point to to make it. And my mother, a very strong woman, you know, so. She already gave me a second chance not taking my life that day for what I did, you know? So I was like, okay, you know, we decided, and now my sister is about a week old. Now you gotta understand for mother to give birth, and her, you know, herself and four boy, you know, four little toddlers pretty much walking across, you know, and it was raining so hard that your foot gets stuck in the mud, you know, you get angry, and I tell her she's hitting and all of that stuff. and. Everybody was aware of that, you know, but there was nobody what I mean it was just it, your luck, you know. I mean you really you realize what the world is at that age at seven and a half years old. And we make it to the first refugee camp and we were like, ooh, you know, we've made it. Then my father said, Oh no no, you guys go back. I don't want you guys here. And at that age I always I was like, man, you you robbed the bank. You have a box full of hundreds. Why why wouldn't you want us to stay with you? He goes, it's not safe. And I told him, it doesn't make really sense. You're telling me it's not safe here, but you're sending me back to a war zone, you know? So it didn't work out very well. So we got sent back to the city again, and this time it was everybody in that. We you walk in and you know people were divided into two sets. You know, um, anybody 13 years old and older was going toward the execution fields by chemical alley, and the women and children, you know, go to the uh, left. You know, and you don't question it; just that's you accept your fate. You know, like that's what's gonna happen to you, and you accept it. So my first time at that early age to see a human being being executed, you know, I was like, I can't. Like, eh? I was a young kid. You know, 22 year olds had nothing to do with nothing, you know. He was from the outskirts, so he was more like a peasant, you know. He had nothing to do with nothing, and they had him hang to this electrical pole, you know. And his sister, you see, a lot of people that in the Arab world take women for granted, or even in the Western world thinking women are Arab women, but Arab women are the strongest of us all. You know, and his sister was the only one fighting for him. Everybody left him, and these, um, so, you know, army dudes were taunting him. You know, they were like stabbing him, and shooting him in the foot, and slapping him. And my mother walks up, and his sister was, you know, young, and she was <coughs> yelling, and shoot at her feet, and she <coughs> was back. You know, 
she runs back and she runs back. And my mother goes, he's somebody's kid, you know? She goes, he didn't do nothing. And the guy looks at her and says, all the traitors will get the same thing, you know? So that was, you know, we knew what was going on, you know, we knew what was happening. And um, at that age, I understood what humanity was, you know, um, men with the gun plays God, you know. It, it, you look at it in, in different ways, but anybody seen war, you understand how it works in one way or another. So we, my mother came back home, she's like, we have to, we have to run away again. Um, but this time, we will not tell nobody, and we will not tell your father. We will go far as we can. We will, we will make you know. And, and I looked at her, and I was like, "We already made it once, and we got sent back. Why would we try again?" And I got smacked. She goes, "Because you don't listen." <laughs> she goes, "You don't listen." So we have to go out, you know. And um, then we made it far as the second refugee camp, you know. And my mother never complained said nothing, you know. Um, she just kept walking and walking until we reached a certain point that um, we knew we made it into a certain refugee camp and now there is no turning point. That you made it in there. And the struggle began there because now, you know, it's, it's a whole different concept. When you strip people from everything, you know, there is no rules now. There is no rules that, in a refugee camp, there is no societal rules. There is no, like, folk rules or morals rules. Rules are rules that they're made by the strong and the prey on the weak. And women and children all, and the elders always get the bottom of the deal. You know, you, you just get handouts, you know. But my mother wasn't that kind of a woman that took it, you know. She's like, screw you, you know. I have four boys. I told her we're too young to fight. But she did everything to bring us to this country. I mean, you know, she never gave up on us. She never left us. She never left us behind. And she is my second chance. And she gave not only myself, but all my brothers and sisters a second chance. And I ask everybody in the audience to give somebody else a second chance in life. Because life is all about second chances. And I guarantee you, if you ever give somebody a second chance, they, most of the time, they will never screw it up. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, thank you.